This is Distant Replay. It's time for another true crime edition of Distant Replay. Welcome in. I'm Ben George. He is Mike Noto. Today, Mike, who is on our list? We have Tommy Kane. Tommy Kane. I don't know much about Tommy Kane. Uh, he's a football player, correct? He's a football player. I didn't know much about him either until we started getting some requests to do him for a true crime episode. And uh, definitely an interesting one that was really, really eye-opening. I'm looking forward to hearing this story here on this episode. Again, we get these a lot of requests on YouTube. So if you haven't subscribed over there and haven't joined the comments, please do. We'd love to hear from you. If you have any thoughts on this episode, past episodes, future episodes you want us to do, please hit subscribe. Like this video, too, if you are listening to it. Take one quick second, that like button. We'd appreciate that. But you can also find us on every podcasting app. Please follow us there as well. And you can connect on Twitter and Instagram. As we do with a lot of most of our true crime episodes, we start with a little bit of background on today's subject, Tommy Kane. All right, Ben. So Tommy Kane is a name. Our Canadian listeners will definitely recognize his name. And if we have if we have any Seattle Seahawks fans in the audience here, they will likely remember his name as well. He was a wide receiver uh, from Canada, played for the Seahawks and played college football at Syracuse. All okay. right. And we're talking his playing career basically spanned um, the mid eighties to the mid nineties, essentially through college, um, and the pros. Okay. He grew, he grew up in a, in a, you know, not so good area of Montreal called little Burgundy, which I'll get to a little bit later during his true crime story. But he basically went from there to Syracuse on a football scholarship was one of the top players on their 1987 team that went 11 and zero. they went 11, zero and one. First of all, were you aware that a Syracuse team had gone 11, zero and one? If you said that, I'd probably be like, uh, it was way back in the day, or it was you know, Donovan McNabb's era. That's probably what I would, would typically guess. Exactly. That's the same way I felt when I was researching. I'm like, man, I can't believe this. I, it went totally under my radar. Their, only, their one tie was to Auburn in the Sugar Bowl. So I just thought that was an interesting aside that I found in my research. But he plays for Syracuse on the 1987 team. He graduates in 1988. He's a surprisingly like good student, according to teammates and teachers, and he's drafted by the Seahawks in the third round. So graduates in 88, drafted by the Seahawks in the third round. Uh, he had a couple good seasons with the Seahawks, Ben, most notably in 1990 and 1991. He had over 50 catches for over 700 yards receiving in each of those seasons and averaged around 15 yards a catch. So those are good NFL stats, especially in 1990 and 1991. Yeah. In 1992, he had some injury problems where he only played 11 games. And by 1993, Ben, he's out of the NFL completely. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of these guys, again, that we that we research where has some good moments in the NFL, but gets injured. And, man, not for long. When people joke around that that's what NFL stands for, definitely in Tommy Kane's case because he's out of the NFL one year after suffering injuries, tries to latch on in in the CFL, with the Toronto Argonauts, which I'm sure is a team name you will uh, recognize, and does not latch on with them. And his true crime story really begins after uh, his professional football career is over. And he finished that career, by the way, too, with the fourth most touchdowns by a Canadian in the NFL, just so you know. He finished with nine total. Not a lot, but still fourth most for Canadians. And that's important to note, Ben, because a a big part of this story is how much he's beloved in his neighborhood and in Montreal. Okay. Well, let's jump into this, the crime portion then, shortly after his career. Okay, so before we get to post-career for Tommy Kane, one thing I wanted to mention was he, when he was at Syracuse, we got a little bit of like kind of a inkling into you know the kind of guy Tommy Kane was. So at Syracuse, he racked up like 15-plus parking tickets, all right? Okay, that yeah, happens. college kid yeah. not knowing where to park, athlete thinks he can park anywhere and go to class. Like right. that's not surprising to me. Right. But eventually these 15 plus parking t- tickets leads to an altercation with a female police officer. Okay. At the time, all the reports said was he got arrested for an altercation with a police officer. He only got community service and missed like no f- no time on the football field kind of thing. You would eventually find out in the coming years that he like physically assaulted the police officer. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. So it was definitely like a bigger deal than was let on. And, you know, had that had that information been known during the time, you know, when it happened, that might could have impacted him even being drafted in the pros, you know. But 
that's one thing that happened in college that kind of was a little bit of a red flag that people would look back on after he did what I'm about to talk about post career. I'm surprised I didn't that he didn't get m- more blowback on that. I don't know if it was just wasn't covered very much, but I would imagine, I mean, assaulting a police officer is pretty serious. And I think I, you know, I think it had something to do with the fact the police officer, I think was like a campus police officer. Okay. So maybe they just kept a lid on everything that way, you know, could be, I couldn't find, remember this is like in the, uh, in the mid eighties. Right. So I couldn't find any information on it. Okay. All right. So like I mentioned before, what's important to understand about Tommy Kane is he's from an area of Montreal called little Burgundy which I've been to Montreal a couple times, not familiar with Little Burgundy. It's a place that is a little bit rougher of an area, right? And and he grew up there, was into some like little, um, like I would call it like juvenile type crimes when he was a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, in and out of trouble, sort of um, maybe not on the great uh, right path, but, you know, athletic straightened about, one of those kind of kids. Right. Ends up at Syracuse, like I mentioned, in the pros, and then what was important to remember about Tommy Kane is throughout everything he went through in his life, he always kept ties to that little Burgundy area. All right. So much so that, you know, he would go back frequently when he played. When he played, he would go back and visit his mother, who he bought a nice house for, you know, in, in a nicer area of Montreal once he started making a little bit of money. Mm-hmm. But he'd always go back, visit like the local youth center that he grew up playing sports in. And during one during his visits back home, he developed a relationship with a neighborhood, uh, someone from the neighborhood named Tamara Shake. Okay. And she's she was Tommy's age. They knew each other when they were younger. And you know, when Tommy started going back to the neighborhood, he said, you know, I I, I like her because I, I don't trust many people. I trust her because I know where she's from. I know what she's about. She's smart, and he feels that he can trust her. They have similar background. They have some mutual friends. So they, they spark up a relationship based on that. Okay. Um, and things seem to be going great for Tommy at this point. He's got Tamara as a, as, a, as a girlfriend. He bought his mother a nice house, like I mentioned. Things are going good for him. Mm. Sounds like it, yeah. Their relationship a lot at the beginning was Tamara would go back and forth from Seattle to Montreal and visit Tommy during the season. Because remember, she had a job at a bank, you know. She yeah. had like a nine-to-five job, responsible person. She had a job, but she would visit Tommy and go back and forth. It was like a some it was like a fairy tale, you know. You have, you have a woman who is from like not that affluent of an area, you know what I mean? She meets, you know, and, and connects with the guy who at the time it was perceived had made it out of that area, is in the NFL. You know, it was like a it was a good story for people from that community. Yeah. You know? So this relationship goes on for three years. Three years into the relationship, Tamara gets pregnant. Okay. Now, what's also going on at this time that you don't really know unless you know the inner workings of their relationship is Tamara gets pregnant. Things things seem good on the surface, but Tommy had like multiple affairs with other women that like Tamara pretty much knew about. You know, she knew that when he when she was in Montreal, she he was doing things that, you know, she probably didn't approve of in Seattle with other women. Mm hmm. But it was the kind of thing where she was willing to deal with a certain amount of that from everything I read and saw, you know, in in the research I did because of the lifestyle she was living, you know? Yeah. She wasn't like a pushover. I don't want to make it sound like that from what I read, but she wasn't like, she wasn't naive either, you know? She kind of knew what was going on. Right. And that's not completely uncommon. It's not. It's not at all. She thought like, hey, this is probably just a phase, you know? He's got all this fame, all this money now. It's a phase. He'll grow out of it. Because remember, he's still a young man at this point. Well, then what happened, Ben, is the whole thing I just described about him getting injured and released from the Seahawks. This happened, like, very abruptly, like like I mentioned. It wasn't like he had a gradual sort of decline from football. Mm-hmm. By age 30, he's completely out of football. Right. I mean, even his stint with the Argonauts is done by age 30. Okay. It brings him closer to Tamara and his son, though, which you would think would be a good thing. Yeah. You know? Um, and when he comes back, he starts to coach at the West End Sports Association, which, again, is like that sports association that I told you he had ties to as a, as a kid. Uh-huh. And he's still like a role model in the neighborhood. Like right. Great people. story. Came back home. Now he's helping he, lead. Yeah, we see that a lot. We see that a lot with sports. You yeah. know, people don't forget where they came from. He became an analyst for the Montreal Alouettes for a year, but that didn't last. So what this leads to, Ben, is we have stressor number one with him his football career getting cut short. Now he has like really like no direction. You know what I mean? Yeah. The, the family starts to struggle financially. They move in with Tamara's mother. So now picture this, he's moving in back in with his, you know, with his mother-in-law 
because, you know, he can't make ends meet. His confidence is like way low, but in, through all this, Tamara is like there for him and to support him. At this point, Ben, we're like almost, we get about a decade into their relationship. And when their son is five years old, so when, when the son that they had that I mentioned before, yeah. Tommy proposes to, to Tamara and they get married. Okay. Okay. And by the year of 2000, they have four kids together. But still in the background here, Ben, is he's having trouble finding something that he's passionate about, and it, now he's completely losing his direction. And he's just never really adjusted fully to life after football is what it seems like when it comes down to it. Okay. He starts partying a lot, doing you know cocaine on the regular, drinking a lot. And this just makes it where, you know, remember, Tamara's the only one working. You know, she's the only one working. She's taking care of the kids. He's out at all hours. And after four years of marriage, she's like, you know what? I had enough. Like, this just isn't working. Nothing I do is helping him. So after four years of marriage, they separate. Okay. Because I know it's rough because Tammy's in a tough spot, in my opinion. You know, she loves Tommy, but he has zero motivation to do anything. Right. Um, he's not He's not even volunteering anymore, you know? Like not even doing anything to keep himself busy. Now, in this time when they separated, Tommy goes into like a deeper kind of depression and Tamara starts to date. And that bothers Tommy a lot. He sort of woke up and said like, Man, I I can't believe that she's like like moving on from yeah, me. Yeah, like this is over. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And he tries to get her back, but she's like it's pretty obvious she's moved on. Like and he starts doing things like calling her at all hours to check on her and see who she's with. Mm -hmm. It gets to the point where he's basically stalking her. Out mm -hmm. of work, drug use, now no more Tamara. Tommy is just like he's like full blown depressed. Um, and his drug and alcohol use obviously makes it worse. Yeah. To the point where he actually checked himself into a psych ward at a local hospital for his depression. Okay. After five weeks of treatment, though, he moves in with his mother, but his mental state is still an issue. And he's still doing drugs. Remember when his, um, when I told you he bought his mother like a really nice house, like in yeah. a nice neighborhood of Montreal? Well, she mm -hmm. still lives there. So he moves in with his mother, um, but she is like really on him about, hey, look, you're acting this way because of the drugs. It's the drugs that's your problem. And he's like insisting, you know, the drugs aren't my problem. You know, I don't have a problem. I'm just depressed because my wife left me and I don't see my kids as much. You know, th that's the story yeah. he's sticking to. Yeah. You know, he, he's, he's, he doesn't think that he thinks he has control of the drug problem. Of course, yeah. So like it's common in situations like this, Ben, the, mo the, the mother wants to organize an intervention for Tommy. Okay. And I... I just can't help to think when I think of an intervention, I think of the Sopranos. I can't help but think of it, but I know. <laughs> Remember when they have an intervention for Christopher? Yeah. Yeah, but all kidding aside, this, this is really, what I'm about to talk about is not a joking moment, but I always think of that whenever right. I even see the word intervention. But anyway, his mother wants to organize an intervention. In her, in, her, in her mind, she's like, in order for this to work, like Tamara has to be involved, you know? She contacts Tamara, says, hey, look, we want to do an intervention for Tommy. Can you please be there? Tamara's really hesitant at first. But she says, you know what? If there's a chance he could turn his life around, mm -hmm. it would really it would benefit my kids. Right. You know, you right. got to remember they still have four kids together. So the intervention is set for uh, the mother's house. So Tamara and her, a friend from her church are the first to arrive there at the mother's house. Okay, when Tamara enters the home, so it's one of those things where he doesn't know Tamara's coming. Okay, yeah. When Tamara enters the home, he attacks her right away. He um, hadn't seen her in a while. What is like filled with rage once he even just like lays eyes on her and attacks yeah. her. Wow. He dragged her into the kitchen by her hair and just started beating her up. Damn. Like it's literally awful. she's on the ground. He's above her, like beating her up. Damn. Smashing her head on the floor, Jeez. doing things of that nature to the point where he grabs a knife to stab her. And when he's making the motion to stab her, you know, like bringing the yeah. knife up. To bring it down, the friend that, that Tamara brought grabs the knife out of his hand while he's going to stab her. Jeez. Which I've never heard of happening ever in any crime I've ever read about or watched any documentary about. Yeah. But then unfortunately, he just grabs another knife and stabs Tamara several times, Jeez. including in the neck. Dang. The, obviously now the... the Tommy gets off of her once he stabs her multiple times. The friend is trying to, you know, obviously help Tamara. But unfortunately, Tamara would be taken to the hospital and be pronounced dead. 
Gee, that's, man, that's brutal. That is like, this is one of the more brutal. This kind of, it, it, we've done some brutal ones, like in terms of the crimes committed, obviously, but this is up there. But just to snap that quickly is, is just insane. Dude, lit, lit, man, literally see her, drag her in the kitchen, bash her head against the ground, and there's just immediate reactions to stab. And I think it's un, unbelievable that the friend grabbed the first knife. Yeah. That's hey, like well, how brave she was trying to, you know, help her friend that much. He must have, like, just had in his head, if I ever see her, I'm going to kill her. You know, like, yeah, just one of those things. And, oh, man, that's awful. It's, it's a terrible. You know, and she's there trying to save him. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, that's her purpose for being there is to contribute to this intervention and try to save him. And it's just absolutely insane. So he gets arrested for second degree murder. The four kids now, because remember, the four kids have now their mother is dead and their father killed their mother. Um, the four kids go with Tamara's sister to live. And the community there is absolutely devastated. Because okay. remember, you had Tommy, who was a hero in that community. And you had Tamara, who was also from there. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. He pleads not guilty to the second degree murder charge. And I don't know if it's the law in Canada or or it's it's everywhere. Remember, this is in Canada. This happened. I guess whether he's guilty of mur- murder or manslaughter is determined on did he mean to do it or did he not? Okay. Like, did he go there with a plan to do it or not? That's the difference between murder and manslaughter in this case hmm. that they had to decipher. Uh, the media gets a hold of this. They cover and bring up that Syracuse incident that I mentioned before. Mm-hmm. Like reporters started to do like really deep dives on his background. Yeah. In 2004, court ordered psychologists said that Tommy was, quote, out of his mind when he killed Tamara. So in that moment, right, he just was overcome with whatever and killed her. Man. He pleaded guilty to the lesser charge of manslaughter and was given 18 years, which in Canada from what I read and from what I've, I heard on different news stories covering this is considered a very harsh sentence for manslaughter. Yeah. It, 18 years for manslaughter. Yeah. That seems like it's a pretty, pretty stiff sentence. It's a sentence up there that you would like, you would, they equate with like a murder. Right. 18 years. I think things are a little bit different up there from that respect. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I think if a crime, this brutal happened in the States and it was considered like a second degree murder, I think that, at, or even, you know, I, first of all, I think it would be considered a murder. And I think the person would probably got more than 18 years. You think that too or no? Well, we've done some crazy cases, though, where people have committed crimes like this and not yeah. gotten as many years as you think, though. You that's, know? What's, yeah, that's what's wild about it. You just never know with the sentencing what, what's going gonna, what's gonna to happen. It doesn't seem like there's consistency. And obviously, I don't know the law that much. So I don't, I don't know. There's obviously plenty of nuance in these cases. But, yeah, there's there's a lot of question on the consistency from, from sentence to sentence. Yeah, there is like that's one of those things that amazes me, Ben. When we go through these, is you think when you think you have a grasp of sentencing guidelines, you know, then something like this happens. Now, this is in a totally different country, so it's even a little bit more confusing because we haven't done. I don't think we, this, this is the first case we've done in Canada. Well, I think about Lil Renton Wright episode we just did, right? His wife, but well, she might be out in nine years, right? Yeah, and she plotted a murder. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, you're right. There's no. It seems like there. It's one of those things where there is a rhyme or reason. There are statutes. Yeah, but they're all like so state specific. Right. You know that that you, it's hard to keep track of them. So I agree with that. Yeah, it is. It is puzzling sometimes. Mm-hmm. But in the end, Tamara's sister was awarded with uh, five hundred thousand to support the kids because remember she has the kids. And in order to do that, um, in order to have the money for that. Tommy had Tommy's mother had to sell that house that he had bought her. Um, not that she, I was guessing she wouldn't want to live there anyway after what happened there. <laughs> yeah. But um, so I was able to research to find out that. And remember, he was sentenced in November on uh, November fifth of two thousand four. Well, what ended up happening was he served two thirds of that sentence. Okay, and was released in two thousand and sixteen. Um, he was re- granted full parole in 2016, the two third mark of his sentence. And, you know, he's since had some issues where he's violated his parole uh, for using drugs and drinking and things of that nature. But as of now, uh, Tommy Kane is actually a free man. Yeah, it's crazy. It says in, that, in a story that out of the Montreal Gazette that, that they, they, you know, they had the statutory release and um, you know, had testing as part of all that. But I guess he was also going back into the U.S. to do this testing for the NFL's, I guess, concussion stuff, which 
I guess arose right. What, when did when did it become more prominent? About that time, right? Maybe a little bit earlier. Yeah, maybe a little bit earlier, but give but, or take. Yeah. But yeah, about that time. So he was going back there, and, he, and then he said his excuse was that the psychological effect it had on me kind of drove me to that, like kind of reliving that stuff again. So I don't know. He's he's still out, as you said, and and I guess the the parole board just kind of was like, hey, you know, move close to your family, and hopefully this can help you kind of better your life. I don't know, but pretty crazy. He's out. Yeah, it is pretty nuts that he's out. Um, yeah, just uh, it's it. You know, Mike. I mean, who knows if it's a CTE issue? But that's like the it's always something you think of in these situations, right? Like just in general, when something happens and it's like a mental like like this, just like a snapping on a dime like that, something so violent, um, it, you just kind of hark back to that, right? It just. It, yeah, not even I, you I, specifically. Just in general, people do that. Yeah, I often wonder if it's just like a something people just turn to as like a lazy way to kind of analyze it though. You know what I mean? Yeah. Before someone's like tested for it or, or there's some kind of, you know, proof that, you know, you know, he did have, he did have serious bouts of depression, you know, in the years leading up to, you know, killing Tamara. Yeah. So maybe that's related to, but I just think sometimes people say CTE, CTE because it's a football player who snapped and it's just like an easy way to sort of connect the dots, you know? Yeah. Um. It, it, who knows, you know, but it's just, it's got to be so painful for Tamara's family, and I don't know what these kids must think. Yeah, there's no question. Is there is there a lot of stuff out there on this if people want to go back and, and kind of do some more research? Yeah, there's a lot of news articles because, remember, he's really, really popular in Canada. He was okay. really popular in Canada. So there's a lot of news articles. Um, there's some YouTube videos. There's some episodes of television shows, like, you know, that are on, like, the ID channel and stuff that cover this case. Yeah. So the information's out there if you want to find it. Okay. Well, I do appreciate that, man. That, that I was not expecting the, the the turn in that story. There is no question. That's definitely one of the more brutal ones, probably the most brutal that, that I've heard you you tell on this, this show. We've done quite a few of these true crimes already. But I do we do appreciate anyone that sent it in, recommended that on the YouTube channel, or sent us a comment on Twitter. We do appreciate that. Again, we, we – we, we put a list down, so if you ever have anything in mind, send it over to us. Mike loves digging into this stuff. I love hearing the stories as well as you. So please uh, let us know. And hit subscribe, hit like on the video if you haven't done that yet. Please, we appreciate it if you made this far. Just, just add that one little like button. We'd appreciate that. But also follow us on whatever podcasting app that you do. And then, uh, again, we're on Twitter, Instagram, and also distantreplaypodcast.com. Thanks, Mike. Hey, thanks, Ben. Pleasure as always, and until next time.